Thank you for coming to the talk today. I really appreciate you all coming out. Um, I want to first thank the Global AppSec uh, Group uh, Committee. They did a fantastic job of putting this together. My first Global AppSec in DC was in 2016, and this is so much bigger than that. So uh, it's exciting to see the community grow. Now I'll have a lot more people that I can complain about uh, things to. So I'm excited about that. Um, anyone watching, I know that we're recording, anyone watching this in the future, um, today is Halloween. There's some Halloween themes in here, uh, so don't think I'm some sort of uh, psycho, uh, just in general. Um, and uh, one last thing, um, I have my Twilio team. Um, they're the real sort of uh, aspirations for this talk. They really built out uh, this program in itself, so I really want to share some a lot of the wins that they've done. So thank you, team. Um, all right, what's this about? Uh, when I, I talk about a concept of foundational programs and scale programs, um, and what I've noticed is a lot of organizations are in this foundational manner, um, and I'll dive deeper in what that means, but I wanna give everyone exposure to what enterprise customers, or companies, and think about at scale. So I definitely want you all to think about that way. Um, and the goal is just to give you some stories about what's the differences between a foundation, foundational AppSec program and a scaled AppSec program. And we're gonna hit three themes. We're gonna talk about hiring, DBM, which is democratized mobility management, and we're talking about scaling uh, tooling as well. Uh, come up, or there's some uh, seats uh, up front, uh, uh, come up. Um, and then I also wanna talk about some leadership potholes uh, that you should avoid uh, within organizations itself. Uh, who am I? I'm Jim Singh. Uh, spent a little over a decade on the software side of things um, and uh, just about a decade on the security side of things as well. Um, I feel that empathy is my superpower. Uh, I've been able to really reduce risks within the business, build strong teams. Um, it's been great that way. I do a lot of OWASP things as well. I'm a huge fan of OWASP. Uh, I've co-lead the OWASP Vancouver chapter. Farshad's our chapter lead there. Um, we put together a regional OWASP event, uh, AppSec PNW, Pacific Northwest. So this year we ha held it in Portland, next year it's in Vancouver. So if you wanna go to bright, sunny Vancouver, it's gonna be hopefully in June. Hopefully it's sunny uh, and hopefully there's no fires, but uh, um, we'll have a lot of great speakers out there. So definitely have a look at that. Um, and I'm super, super passionate about security culture. Um, I want to build security into the fabric of companies. Uh, and I want everyone to think about uh, security, not just the engineers. Uh, like I, I love when we have other folks uh, thinking about security all the uh, time. And I think uh, my current claim to fame is that uh, I uh, switched from a director role at uh, Twilio to a more of an IC role. I'm uh, working at uh, Rippling. And um, first, a lot of people ask me why I did it. I posted on LinkedIn. I think I had about a dozen people ask me about it here as well. Uh, I, I could do a full talk on that. So if you want to ask questions about that, we can, we can chat after, after this particular talk. Um, let's talk about uh, AppSec maturity. And please note, there's no official framework. This is how I look at things at the company level, but also at the program level at a bunch of different companies. So um, I usually put things in four different buckets, no maturity, foundational maturity, scaled maturity, and bleeding edge. Um, and it really allows me to assess the, uh, the maturity of each of the programs, but the overall program itself. Um, and what that means is no maturity is pretty straightforward. Um, either you don't have a program in place, or, or worse, um, your program is actually detrimental. Uh, so I've seen programs where you add friction for the sake of ad adding friction, which makes no sense at, at all. And foundational uh, maturities where I feel that most of the companies are within. So you are, maybe you have uh, not even a dedicated AppSec team. Um, you have a single security team that does all the security things. That, that, that's quite common. Um, you might even have an AppSec team, but they're not really fully engaged or being able to deliver 100% AppSec itself. Um, you get developers to somewhat fix vulnerabilities. Uh, they do it, and sometimes they do it, you have to chase them, um, uh, challenges like that. Um, you have some of the tools integrated the e ecosystem, or maybe you've actually got tools and you haven't even integrated at all. I've been at companies where we were really good at procuring, but we weren't really good at uh, integrating at all. And then you may threat model here and there, but you don't have actually a real plan. 
the vast majority of your time is actually spent on fires and making sure that you're dealing with fires. Um, and a scale program is that next level. Uh, you are starting to move from this ad hoc way of doing security. You have a strategy, a focus, a vision. Um, your security tooling is properly integrated ecosystem. You know because you have metrics. You have the metrics on coverage. You quantify it. You actually see how that's working. The data from the security tooling, it's all ingested into your central data store. And you can actually make a program on how to reduce risk that you're seeing within the uh, tools themselves. Um, and you have, um, there's a concept of a paid path. Now that's the path that most engineers want to go through. And you spend time actually securing that, uh, making sure that that's the right way to go. And if uh, development uses this, they get a lot of security things for free. A bleeding edge is that next level beyond, it's beyond scaling. You're actually having the opportunity to experiment and see how you can do things better. So maybe your SCA, um, where uh, your third party uh, open source libraries, you're auto patching now and it's every you're reducing the cognitive load on engineering, but also you're making things a lot more easier for your engineering uh, security engineering teams as well. Maybe you're teaching your developers to threat model. Um, so they're doing all the easier threat models and you're still involved with the more complicated ones itself. But you're really experimenting and finding ways how to reduce risk and be much better within your program itself. So again, in this talk, we're gonna talk about the foundational one um, and how you can think about scale in itself. All right. So um, philosophy around uh, scale programs, I'm sorry, I noticed a spelling mistake. Number one shouldn't be higher uh, demon crazied uh, <laughs> individuals. It's supposed to be democratized individuals. Apologies for that. Um, that so is the best mistake ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Halloween, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, there are three things that I like to think about, like uh, hiring really strong individuals, but you want to uh, really democratize the decisions and the work when you're thinking about a scaled program itself. Um, you know what, um, I say uh, democratized a lot, but what does that actually mean? Um, democratized to me is like your security is not the only one doing security things. Um, you are actually sharing the knowledge, you're sharing the work, you're actually sharing, um, you're being transparent to how decisions are made. Um, we work really closely with our partners. Uh, mostly, most of the time it's gonna be engineering, but uh, some of the time it could be other legal, finance, all those other teams as well. We wanna make sure that we're really partnering with them, but we're also holding them accountable for what they need to do. Um, uh, so all of the risk decision isn't solely made by security. We were actually sharing that responsibility. And ideally, that information should be made to a lot of people within the organization. It doesn't make sense to make it available to everyone, but it makes sense to really share it with a lot of the folks within the organization. So that's what democratized means to me. So we're gonna talk about building a scalable programs. I'm only gonna, there's hundreds of programs that you need to do within an organization to really make security scale. We're just gonna cover um, the top three that uh, worked really effectively for me at Twilio. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we can dive much, much deeper into those programs. Um, uh, at, like I have a, a lot of resources to really dive deeper for that. So. When on top of my list is hiring the right people. Um, you can't have a proper scale program without having the right people on the team. Um, it, that's like a must uh, in general. And uh, one of the most successful programs that I've seen in my career is a democratized vulnerability management. We'll dive deeper in what that actually means. Um, but um, by far, this has reduced the most amount of risk that I've ever seen in my career. And you also want to operationalize your security tools. So if you can do those three things and do it pretty effectively, you've got a really, really strong program in itself, a very strong scaled program. Okay, hire the right people. Um, we all know that you need right people for doing the right thing in the business. But that, what does that actually mean? Um, who are the right people? Are those those 10X and security engineers that you always hear about? Um, and once you, you hire them, how do you actually retain them as well? So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about foundational program versus uh, the scale program. Um, in a, f a foundational program, it's not necessarily you have, we talked earlier about, you might not have individuals that focus on application security. They might be just security engineers itself. They might focus on CloudSec, ProdSec, 
um, also enterprise security, anything uh, in general. Um, the thing is that uh, the team is small and it's quite unfocused. Um, there's no real uh, idea of what uh, that future vision looks like. Um, you may even have a generic interview process. Um, it's quite possible that the hiring manager is non-technical. They may not even know how to hire really, really technical, really strong uh, security engineers themselves. And um, there's no real carved out roles or responsibilities uh, in a foundational program. But it's very, very different for a skilled program itself. So you have a very specific app application security team. It has a charter, it has a mandate, it knows exactly what it needs to do. There's a North Star. Um, people know what the program should look like in a couple of years in itself. The interview process is very well defined. You have a rubric, you know the type of individuals that you want to hire. You know at what level, what uh, capabilities each individual should have in itself. And you also have a very well defined career ladder in itself. And that's really important in a skill program. Um, you want to make sure that the people that you have on your team can grow and they know how they can grow. Uh, getting to that uh, next level, it's hard, but this should be well-defined. There should be an easy carved out path so that everyone, the managers, the individuals know how exactly people get to that next level. So uh, democratized employees, uh, I, when I hire, I look for democratized employees and these people are unique. They're unique in the industry because they're team players. Um, they care more about their stakeholders, the end users, um, more than they care about what happens to themselves. They're super passionate about helping others. Uh, they lead with empathy and they're much happier when the team is celebrated, uh, their successes, than their individual successes in themselves. So um, folks like this are committed to transparency. Um, they make everyone stronger. And they're not afraid of change. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been at organizations. Um, Twilio has gone through so much changes over the year. Um, and the team that was there was resilient to the change, to the chaos uh, at times within the organization. And these are the democratized employees that I, I look for. Um, and they're not, uh, they partner with engineering, but they're not afraid to push back as well. Um, they're not pushovers where like, they won't get steamrolled by engineering saying, we don't have enough time. Um, they will go through the appropriate uh, channels to make sure that the right thing is done for the business. And you need to build a team that has a diverse background, and uh, just diversity as well. You're not going to get a real strong scaled program if you have one type of individual. Um, you need to make sure that there's diversity of ethnicity, of gender, of careers, of uh, knowledge. Uh, it's really important to have that as part of your uh, security team. Um, how to democratize, uh, how to hire democratized uh, engineers. Probably tell a story uh, about this one. Um, so I took over the product security team at Twilio at the end of uh, 2021. Um, and then the great resignation happened in 2022. Uh, so that was an interesting time. Uh, my morale was kind of low. Um, I've never, I've been a manager for a good chunk of my career. Um, and I don't think I've had so many people leave uh, in this, such a short time. Uh, checking if it was me uh, driving people out but uh, like with all the cons there was always, all, always pros as well and what that meant is I got to build my team. I, I got to really focus on what I think is the best for Twilio at that time so um, and the market was really competitive. Uh, the first quarter I took over we had put out three offers and no one accepted those offers so I myself started diving deeper into it and I got really involved with the hiring process. And one of the first things that I did was um, I, I was doing the hiring manager interviews myself. Um, so I spent about half an hour on the first interview just finding out who this individual is, what level of capabilities they have. And then I did the reverse interview. I gave the rest of the half an hour for them to interview me and understand what uh, the team is like, the company is like, what challenge that we have. I think. Um, some of them were probably surprised about with the, my amount of candidness uh, as a part of it. I was very brutally honest. Uh, there were a lot of challenges that we have at Tulio, um, but uh, because uh, these are the people that I'm looking for are democratized employees, they're looking for those challenges. They are not. They don't want to come to companies where it's easy to fix things. They want to have that challenge. 
they want to learn, they want to grow. Um, and I got a lot of great feedback as part of the process. Uh, I see Sarah here uh, today. Uh, one of the great things that she told us that she's like, um, I didn't see any gender diversity as part of the hiring um, selection, which was uh, something that we didn't uh, really think about. Uh, and we're like, that's a great thing that thank you for sharing with us. And we changed that as part of our hiring mandate afterwards. And other folks, uh, it took a lot of convincing to come over. Um, and I made sure that I made myself available to make sure that I cleared up any of their concerns uh, in itself. So be honest with where you are. Um, make sure that you uh, let folks know what's good, but also let, let them know what's bad and sell them on the opportunity. Don't sell them on the company, sell them on the opportunity of learning, growth, and what they're going to be able to do with hair. Um, yeah, and I was very lucky. Uh, we built out a, literally a superstar team at Twilio. It's incredible. I uh, see a lot of them in the crowd today, so thank you for coming out. But like, I'm very, very proud of all the stuff that they've been able to achieve. Um, uh, this one might be a little bit obvious, but I've been at companies where um, managers don't hire people smarter than them. Um, they're afraid. Um, they're afraid that uh, the individuals on their team might take over more responsibilities. I'm the opposite. I'm, I love when people are, my team is much smarter than me. I can easily say that. Uh, they are very capable. And the more that they grow, that means there's less work I have to do. Uh, they took over more of my work, so I'm happy about that as well. Uh, so star, star, smart people want to work for strong leaders, set a vision and a North Star for them. Um, and they solve fewer problems, but solve them well, uh, just in general. And make sure that you're honest with them. There's a lot that you can do as a manager, but there's a lot that you can't do as well. And they'll continue to work hard for you. So uh, potholes, uh, there's a couple of potholes. Um, one is not having a vision. Uh, in a scaled environment, you need to absolutely have a vision. You need to know what two years, three years may look like. And it's easier for everyone to row in the same direction if they know where you're going. Uh, so that's something that you really need to do. And the vision is aspirational. Um, your two-year vision might take you four years to get there, and that's totally OK. Um, but you'll have a much more concrete one-year uh, part uh, of your roadmap. Um, and um, you have to continue selling your vision. Um, so sell it both to the team itself, but outside the team. Um, in marketing terms, I think you have to tell a story eight times before it sort of settles in. So continue doing that. Continue selling your vision in itself. Um, this one's a hard topic for me to talk about, but I feel that we really need to discuss this. Uh, one toxic individual can disrupt the entire team. Um, so um, when you take over a team or if you're building up a team, um, make sure that you identify folks that are afraid of change, people that poison the well, people that demo uh, demotivate others, People that bring problems and never bring solutions and just are just challenging uh, in itself. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm not saying fire them. Um, work well with them. Uh, let them know how they can change and grow. Um, I love when people are able to just grow and be beyond um, what their mental model is in itself. But uh, set a timeline for improvements. Um, uh, it shouldn't be affinity. Um, set a strong timeline. Make sure that you see the improvements, and if you don't, um, it's time to manage them out of the business. So um, again, w you, you might have an all-star team, but if you have one individual that's super toxic, you're not going to be able to deliver how you need to deliver. Um, we're going to talk about democratized vulnerability management. What is it? Um, it's a term that means a lot of different things in a lot of different companies. When I'm talking about vulnerability management, I'm really talking about the uh, tickets, uh, vulnerability tickets, and how do you manage the vulnerabilities themselves. So um, I don't know if you all had uh, difficulties with vulnerability management, but um, it's been a massive pain point uh, in my career in itself. Um, I don't know about you, but I hate chasing engineers. I feel that that's busy work. Um, and while it does reduce risk, it's not very valuable to me. Like. Uh, I can't burn as much risk as I should be able to burn in itself. So, um, and then you have to chase them and tell engineers, hey, go through this uh, lengthy SLA extension process. Um, and may, may, they may not. Uh, and your whole program is quite dirty in itself. 
Uh, and um, a lot of VPs are not even aware. They might be a uh, critical vulnerability in their organization. They might not even be aware of it um, because a lot of the work is done at the IC level or maybe engineering management level. So it's really, really uh, done deep in the trenches. So um, uh, the challenge here is that the, the security program doesn't have a strategic way to actually address these vulnerabilities. And you're not being able to burn as many problems as you can uh, in a more uh, foundational program. It's very done, very ad hoc in itself. So in comes democratized vulnerability management. Um, again, this is the single most important security program that I've seen in my career. I've never seen anything burn down as much risk. There's actually talks I'll share it at the end of this, a uh, um, couple of great ones. One's done by Eric Ellett, one's done by Ariel. Uh, uh, she's here, so don't be afraid to pick her mind afterwards as well. I'm volunteering her time now that I'm not her boss anymore. <laughs> so uh, um, the philosophy is that we are moving security's responsibility out of the vulnerability management process. We're only responsible for identifying risk and reporting risk back to the either the executive team or engineering leadership team. The actual responsibility for security lies within the engineering team. So, um, and since that, that they're responsible, we also want to make it an easy workflow for them. If they need to extend SLAs, it's self-service. And we made it self-service in a way that the right risk owner has to be involved. So if uh, you're going over SLA for a P4 or a 5, uh, a low or an informational vulnerability, um, it automatically gets approved. Um, if it goes to P3, uh, a director is involved. P2 uh, goes to a VP. And P1s go to uh, the SVP or a GM uh, in itself. So when you take it to these levels, if the right individual is involved as part of the SLA process, they're gonna be, they will understand what type of risk that they own within their business. And it really makes them quantify how much time that they should be spending on security itself. Um, and without doing much, uh, we actually see a lot of vulnerabilities getting fixed on their own. We don't have to chase a lot of folks. We do the reporting at the highest of levels and we just work with the very high level SVPs, VPs in itself. And here's a, just a sh small ticket example to show what's happening here. So you can see that the risk owner is me, the severity is there, we put the SLA within the severity itself and we uh, ha highlight who is the highest uh, person that needs to be uh, involved, the uh, GM. So again, you'll notice that the risk owner is already populated, someone's assigned to it um, and in if it's a valid vulnerability, um, we're gonna keep the original remediation date so we know how long it is. And then we also keep track of seeing how many people extend the vulnerabilities. So uh, we do have a what we call a can kicking metric to better understand who's actually fixing vulnerabilities and who's actually accruing a lot more uh, security technical debt. And why does this work? Um, I, I, I think I can explain it with a story uh, in itself uh, within this is segment days. Um, we had, there was a P2 vulnerability, a high vulnerability, and what happened was that uh, a VP had already extended this uh, vulnerability, um, and uh, another engineering team, they came back, uh, and they're like, hey, we need another extension, and the VP is like, okay, let's hold on one second here. Um, I've already approved it, uh, and if there's anything that goes wrong, my name is literally on this, and everyone's gonna blame me. Um, and VPs don't like getting blamed for things that, uh, yeah. So um, what he asked was that I need to know who's gonna work on it, what they're gonna do, and how long it's gonna take. Uh, by the end of the day, the engineering team had it together. They told them that uh, this particular individual is gonna work on it, here's the plan. It's gonna take us five weeks to work on it. And he's like, it's okay. He understood the plan and he's like, that's fine. Um, it was fixed in a week and a half because no one's going back to that VP for asking for another extension. So if you have the right risk owners involved, things will get done. And that was the most powerful part of our DBM process. So um, again, there's, uh, I'll have uh, references afterwards so you can take uh, 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 like uh, shots of it and follow on it. At Twilio, we literally eliminated 60% of the vulnerabilities uh, within uh, year one, which um, engineering kept on blowing away my expectation over and over and over again. So within the first quarter um, of it being properly set up, we had, uh, I think, about 550 vulnerabilities actually burnt down. 
Um, and uh, I was surprised. Uh, I did not expect that. I had assumed that engineering cared about security, but I didn't realize they cared this much about security in itself. Um, Q2, we removed all of our P1 vulnerabilities. Uh, it was all gone. Q3, um, uh, the exec uh, sort of told us, we're going to come on a new plan. We're going to generate a lot of P1s. So what we're actually doing, we're operationalizing our security tools and identifying critical vulnerabilities in our security tools. We're loading that into our DVM process, where, again, engineering did really well. I think they within that uh, few weeks span, they actually burnt down 50% of the risk there. So if you have the right individuals involved, uh, they will make things sure things happen. So again, uh, super proud of that particular program itself. Um, one pothole to avoid in that uh, Q3, what we noticed is that since we were generating a lot of these P1 vulnerabilities, we're sending a lot of communication to the VPs and we're drowning out uh, a lot of things that actions that we, we needed them to work on. So um, that was a moment that um, we could have anticipated, uh, um, but yeah, uh, something that we were going to iterate on. So again, um, Potholes to avoid. Don't overwhelm your engineers. Uh, make sure that uh, they, the comms are in uh, small and concise. Send them in. Send them comms where they are going to actually listen to them. So if it's email or Slack, uh, send it there. Um, also understand the operating metrics. Uh, so uh, we have a workflow. I want to make sure that the vulnerabilities that we have identified they don't stay in the security queue for very long. We actually triage it and send it over to the appropriate uh, teams. And um, since this program was so successful, um, the exec wanted to put everything through it, risk uh, other sorts of tickets, and um, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> make sure that you focus uh, these programs on what it really is meant for. So uh, highly recommend that. All right. So the third program, uh, so we hired really strong individuals, roll out your uh, democratized mobility process, but you also have to scale your security tools. So I'm going to be repeating myself a lot because I don't think uh, most people, uh, most companies really fully uh, operationalize their tools. So uh, I might be saying a few things over and over again. Um, we'll talk a little bit about foundational program versus scaled. So tools are not well integrated into the ecosystem. So I've been at companies where we literally have acquired tools and we didn't even integrate it 1%. Um, and I've been at other companies where it's integrated, but we don't even know how much it's been integrated. So that's definitely a challenge in the skill program. You have full coverage, full metrics, um, and you know exactly how deep it's integrated in itself. Um, you, in a, in a foundational pro uh, program, uh, you probably don't have an asset inventory, and a lot of the information is tribal. Um, you know exactly who should be responsible for these vulnerabilities just because you've been there long enough to know that. In a more scale program, you should have a strong asset inventory. Um, in a foundational program, tools are more meant for informational purposes. You sort of figure out, okay, what are the type of vulnerabilities that are here? And then sort of informs your, loosely informs your roadmap on what you need to do. In a more integrated environment, you're using the data to drive your roadmap in itself. So, and we talked a little bit about uh, dashboards, uh, but like no dashboards in a foundational program, but you have uh, all the data and tools and dashboards uh, built out in a more scaled program. So some subtle changes, uh, differences within foundational and scaled programs itself. Um, a bunch of different type of tools that you can find in the skill program. Uh, you have so many vendors out there. Go talk to your vendors. Uh, I'm, I don't know if uh, any vendor is here, but I'm sure that they're happy that I'm saying that. Uh, okay. Uh, good tooling integration, what does that actually mean? Um, one of the things uh, that I love doing is really working closely with engineering. Um, they're the ultimate users of the tools or the end users of the tools. So you want to make sure that you're selecting tools that reduce the friction between those two uh, uh, groups. And they should actually help you POC these tools. Uh, they should be a part of that POC process because if you're adding friction and they don't want to use the tool, um, you rather find out in the POC side before you actually uh, roll things out. Um, each tool, um, you should know uh, you should know the coverage and have keep pushing towards 100% uh, uh, coverage. That doesn't typically happen. 100% is hard, uh, but if you can get it there, that's uh, great to know. Um, and ideally, you pull out all of the data of 
from the tool and put into a central data store. Um, one of the things I've been talking to the vendors uh, here is that I want all the data to be able to, I want to be able to pull it into S3 and uh, they, vendors don't know how I'm going to cut up the data itself. So get it into S3 and I'll be able to dashboard how I think is most appropriate. So, um, and you want to actually figure out what is the remediation efforts with engineering. So if there are certain classes of vulnerabilities that you see over and over again, maybe you want to work with them and uh, build out something within the pay path uh, itself. So if you notice a lot of XSS or server-side request forgery, work with them and really build out a pay path uh, in general. So um, <coughs> one thing that happened uh, in the September timeframe, there's a vulnerability libwebp that came out. and um, this particular vulnerability could potentially lead to an RCE um, w using that particular library. Now, this was much more impactful on the enterprise side of things because if you have a browser, or if you have a Slack, or some tool that is actually r rendering images, you can actually have a RCE there. Not as impactful within the product AppSec side, um, but um, uh, I want to walk through like how things happen and what visibility does. So. We've fully operationalized one of our SCA tools. We pull out all the data, and in the morning, Alejandro here was able to, he noticed like, oh, this seems like it might be a big deal. Let me just build out a dashboard and uh, see where all the instances of it in the library is, or in the ecosystem it is, this library. And we knew exactly where it is. We knew how many instances of it, and we're able to communicate that very effectively with our BISO org. We use BISOs within the uh, Twilio organizations because it's a big organization. We have thousands of developers, and these BISOs have good relationships uh, with uh, engineering themselves. So we work with them, and um, it was like a P2, like a high, lower, closer to a medium on our end, a P2, P3 on our end, um, and we, some of the BISOs wanted tickets, other BISOs said put in a spreadsheet, and uh, next day when we came back, like it's not a critical, so we didn't need to fix it immediately. Next day when we came back, um, the spreadsheet BISO had already gotten the engineering team to remediate half of those vulnerabilities. So that wasn't the same across the entire ecosystem. Uh, and it, I'm not saying that everything is uh, chocolate and flowers at Twilio, but um, if you have a strong process, like we went from not uh, we went from not knowing about this vulnerability, when we discovered it, uh, we already built out the dashboards and we were already working with our BISO organization and we were already able to remediate half the vulnerabilities in one particular VU. Um, very, very quickly. So in a foundational program, you struggle to even know where the vulnerabilities are. So um, I, I know a lot of us ran into the log for a shell situation. A lot of us didn't even know where the, that particular library was in our ecosystem. It was a challenge. But if you have a bit more foundational program, uh, scale program, you pull all that data, you centralize it, and you can really move fast with respect to that. Um, potholes to avoid. Uh, not pushing left, um, so we have Tanya here. Uh, no, she knows a little bit about pushing left. Um, I, and we want to push all the way left. Uh, uh, if you're using GitHub, I always uh, I talk to the vendors here and say that I need comments on the PRs. I don't want to do that C CICD. I don't want to use a different UI. I want to reduce the amount of friction that engineering has. I don't want them to contact switch at all. Uh, they should be in, the data should be in the tools that they use. So you know, continue uh, to pressure vendors to uh, push further left. Um, and uh, ideally, like the, we are not creating vulnerability tickets in JIRA. That's always a worst case scenario. Um, uh, we find things retrospectively. Again, we want to push as much left as we uh, do. And we always want to avoid tools that um, find vulnerabilities after the app is deployed. That's, that's always a pain for engineering itself. Another anti-pattern that I see a lot is ticket all of the things. Um, please don't do that. Um, ticket the most important things. Uh, um, I've been at an organization where um, uh, one of the security engineers felt that we needed to ticket the 50,000 vulnerability tickets out of our tool and um, cheer us slow down. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you want to start slow, and then you slowly work your way up. So please don't um, ticket all of the things right away. And um, 
use the tool effectively. Uh, I, I have a philosophy uh, on crawl, walk, run, and sprint. Crawl is integrate the tool, um, pull out all the data, and provide dashboards for your partners. And the proactive partners, they'll actually start patching things. Um, walk is build minimum thresholds. So an example of that is we have a SCA tool that we use uh, and it gives us uh, severity and the maturity of the exploit. So um, anything that was critical with a mature exploit, we thought that was, you know, start generating uh, some of those tickets there. And as the engineering teams get better at patching those, we'll continuously lower the bar and get them to patch more. Uh, run, we want to actually block people from uh, adding critical or high vulnerabilities uh, in the ecosystem. And Sprint would be auto-patching things in general. So most people ask, why do you have uh, walk and run in that way? I probably want to reverse it. And I, I typically want walk to be uh, generating tickets because I want to build that patching muscle within engineering. They have to patch at some point, but helping them build that patching muscle makes it really good. And then they, we can get to the gating afterwards. All right, okay, there's some human potholes to avoid as well um, when building out your scaling program, um, not working with your partners. Uh, so I absolutely hate it when decisions uh, for me or my team are made without me being present. Um, that, uh, it's like one of my pet peeves. And um, I want to lead with empathy when I'm making decisions that will greatly impact others. I want to actually work really closely with them. Um, one of the things that uh, I was working towards uh, getting at Twilio was that you know, we have a platform engineering team. Um, we work really, really closely with them. I was going to invite them to our planning session so that they know what we're talking about, what we're uh, potentially going to be working on. And I was hoping for vice versa and sitting in their planning sessions as well. So really act like partners uh, and not uh, separate teams in itself. Um, make sure that you re meet them regularly. So um, make sure that your partners are actually partners. Um, one of the bigger potholes, uh, I, again, I love to lead with empathy. Um, I, I always feel that we can up-level everyone with the knowledge. And uh, one of the bigger failings that uh, I feel that I had as a leader is that I thought that we can bring everyone along and everyone can agree on what I think would be great programs. Um, one of them was DBM. Um, I th again, this is the best program that I felt that we would ris risk. Uh, so Ariel did a great job of mapping out what the actual program is going to look like. She shared it with all the stakeholders. And we got maybe 80% of the people to actually understand and agree. And the holdouts were, they've been longer at Twilio, and they know that at Twilio scale, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, so um, we sat down with them, just try to understand and try to um, reduce that. And so I had a lot of conversation reduced uh, half of those, so we got to about 90%, and we still had the really hardcore holdouts at the 10%. Uh, and um, we kept on escalating it, and eventually got our CISO to sort of weigh in on how we should move forward, and CISO felt that we should go down that uh, democratized uh, path. So w what I've learned is that uh, you can't always bring everyone along for the ride, and, it's, and that's okay. People have their different experiences, but if you can bring the vast majority people um, along for the ride, that's all you need. You don't need 100% of the folks. So definitely avoid that sort of po pothole um, when you are building out your program. All right, uh, the last uh, human pothole. Um, democratize doesn't mean bottom up. Um, a lot of the time it is, uh, you wanna make sure that the folks um, within uh, the engineering, the ICs, the managers themselves, understand and know what to do with respect to security, but um, top-down works quite effectively as well. Uh, you have to democratize the VPs as well, uh, make sure that they really are passionate and care about security. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of different ways that you can do that. We, ha we had monthly business reviews where the exec level um, would, uh, exec level would actually, t uh, we'd tell them the type of vulnerabilities, the trends that we're seeing uh, in general. Um, uh, one of the more effective ones that we've had recently is what we call water meetings, W-O-T-R, um, weekly operational technology reviews. So parts of the ecosystem, the engineering ecosystem, they would uh, meet together, the entire uh, management staff, so BP down to engineering managers, and they would talk about all their operational engineering, but also security. So initially, with respect to security, the BISA would come in, talk about security, talk about the trends and all that. 
Um, and the VP made a switch. He had all the engineering managers talk about their operational tasks when it came to security. And then you saw a lot of that security culture being built up that way. So that was quite impressive. Um, we also send out weekly security emails and the top-down pressure really works. So um, resources, so um, you're not in it alone. Uh, a lot of us are going through these sort of challenges. A lot of companies are in that foundational uh, maturity itself. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me. There's only so much I can talk about in, uh, in a 40, 45 minute uh, talk, but I can really deep dive uh, if you have uh, deeper questions uh, just in general. So, um, and um, Twilio team is here as well. Uh, there's a bunch of them here. Feel free to ask them questions. They're really adept at knowing how to scale security programs as well. The LinkedIn, uh, I don't really use Twitter too much, uh, but um, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, and then uh, links, so uh, top two links are the DVM program. Uh, so Eric Ellett talks about it. He talked about it at Besides SF. Uh, Ariel talked about it at uh, Scaling App Sec Conference as well. So definitely uh, review those. That's a fantastic program. Hoping next year Alejandro will be able to talk about scaling security tooling uh, at a conference. Uh, so, um, but call to action, build demo, demon crazy, uh, <laughs> um, engineers, um, uh, DVM is a fantastic program. So learn more about it, ask us uh, more questions and see how you can leverage that, reducing uh, risk in your business and fully integrate your tools and burn down risk that way. Okay, so to wrap things up, thank you for listening to me babble on. Uh, <laughs> Big, big thank you to OWASP, uh, the team here, um, and the Toyo Secure team. You guys did a fantastic job. All right, any questions? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I also know I'm, I'm around, I'll be walking around. If you have more questions than the three minutes we have left, um, just hit me up. Hi, Jivan, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I work at a large consulting company, and as you can imagine, it's a partnership-based model, so there's different, everything is very decentralized. Um, so I imagine at a large tech company like Twilio, um, there are kind of centralized um, power structures and things like that. But when it's decentralized, do you have any thoughts or advice on how to implement something like DMV or sorry, DVM? DVM, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would start with uh, um, this one. I would probably do a top-down approach um, and first build out the program. It's like build out the program, but like the basics of the program, and then actually sell it, sell it to the various leaders uh, within the organization and really talk to them why it's going to actually reduce the amount of uh, effort on their end uh, in itself. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the vulnerability burn down we saw was just this simplified process. There wasn't five different ways of actually dealing with vulnerabilities itself. So um, we, we can talk more, I can dive deeper, but like that, I feel that at a company that's decentralized, you really need a top-down approach rather than um, anything else, uh, yeah. Hey, um, you mentioned later in, in your talk about a tool that produced 50,000 vulnerabilities and not wanting to put that in JIRA. But then earlier you mentioned that um, uh, th there was about 550 vulnerabilities that were um, reduced um, yeah. pretty quickly. I'm just wondering what those 550 vul vulnerabilities were like, um, you know, what was it more than one tool yeah. What, what, um, did you favor Great results question. from a certain kind of tool over, yeah. over others? Perfect. Um, those are two different companies. Uh, I'll state off. Uh, um, the first company, uh, 50,000, was many companies ago. Um, with respect to the, the vulnerabilities that we had, all we at that time, we had a lot of on particular <laughs> type of tooling. So um, our uh, programs, I, I think, is probably a better term for it. So. One was uh, our bug bounty program. We had a lot of uh, vulnerabilities coming in from there, pen testing, but we also had a bit from our SCA at that point uh, in itself. And actually, um, we also had a lot of uh, um, our cloud security uh, platform. Uh, so there are many from that side, and then we started slowly operationalizing the rest of our tools. We still have a bit of ways to go, but we operationalized a lot more of their tools there. But the goal is not to suck in everything the most critical and work your way down. So we only cared about the critical and highs and then slowly we'll get to the mediums. I don't think 
um, while chaining vulnerabilities, low vulnerabilities is a thing. Uh, I think it'd be very difficult to do that without uh, patching automation. Perfect. So the question for people watching at home is uh, risk owners is, um, oh man, I'm going to butcher this, <laughs> but I'll, maybe I'll answer the question. So um, you always have a conflict with product because product wants to build products and security wants to reduce your technical debt. Um, and I don't think it's always a uh, friction or a clash. Security, we own the severity. We'll tell we have the enough uh, knowledge to say that, yeah, this is uh, what we feel is a critical vulnerability, we should work on it, or this is a high vulnerability, we can work on it. Um, and you can actually produce sorts of metrics that will show the maturity of a particular um, BU. So we had a, a metric called security technical debt metric. It sort of showed us over time if you're accruing a lot more security technical debt vulnerabilities in itself, and some parts of the organization were really good and other parts were horrible. And we'd want to work with the folks that are horrible and figure out why. Um, is it because you have a legacy system and, and people are afraid to actually patch or do anything with it? Or is it because uh, we are, this is a st startup-like uh, type of part of the organization and we're actually, we don't care about security yet. We're just looking for a product market fit. So I, I think the data is only part of the story where we actually want to really work closely with our partners to better understand why, but we have to push back if we don't have agreements with them. So um, easy for us to sort of, like we had a, we were building a really strong culture with the exec of really caring about security. So it, it was really easy to get buy-in from the highest levels. Yeah. I know we're at time. I'm around. So if you have tons of questions, pick my mind. I'm, I'm here. I'm here to really support and make sure that we're moving away from foundational programs into more skilled programs. All right, thank you all.